what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to take us through a few diagrams. And I'm going to start with the diagrams in the book. Um, and then I'm going to look at a few different ways of um, representing some of this and um, some of the intuitions that drop out of uh, exploring uh, what these diagrams look like. Um, and then I'll kind of uh, conclude with talking about how to use um, a, a kind of a just, it's not as much in the, in, in the chapter and so on, but given this, uh, I'll sort of mention why uh, crypto economics is an extremely, extremely powerful lever right now in this point of time in our history uh, to sort of warp the incentive fields uh, and get us to arrive at prior dystopia or prior dystopias. Um, so the the diagrams here, I think, are, are phenomenal. Um, and, you know, they sort of go into the different, um, uh, they sort of take this very simple uh, plot between Alice and Bob's preferences. Uh, we look at the um, current state of the world uh, as a red dot. Uh, we plot a kind of, you know, traditional styles here, some um, uh, interaction with the red line. Uh, we can look at kind of destructive uh, cases of negative sum games uh, towards the bottom left. Um, and then we look at the different preference, preference fields um, from the perspective of each of Alice and Bob. So here's uh, Bob's preferences. Um, and we can also look at you know, the symmetric um, view of Alice's preferences. We can pull those together um, and arrive at this kind of uh, positive sum uh, interaction. Uh, from there, this is the, the upper and right quadrant that Mark uh, and Allison uh, are referring to and um, that I think uh, all of us are sort of aiming for, which is that um, once you can um, engage in voluntary co cooperative um, uh, systems, uh, you, you get into this this being able to look at these potential future um, being preferable to to all the parties, um, because even though there's a set of positive sum games um, that could you know theoretically be um, leave the entire system better off, uh, they take resources from each other or they take perceived resources, and you can see this in the in the um, other diagrams where we can see kind of um, in the Bob fights or Alice fights uh, regions, um, parties will not be uh, particularly happy about ending up there. Uh, nor will they be uh, landing in the NB um, uh, quadrants. It's worth pointing out that um, in the kind of NB regions, uh, everybody is better off. Um, and when when we look at the orders of magnitude that I'm going to show in a moment, uh, everybody's better off by a lot. Um, but it's still, there's still some some really deep intuitions um, about why these kinds of systems may not be, or, or or why we it would be very difficult for us to arrive at these at these uh, these structures. Uh, so I'm going to hop to a different uh, view now. Um, and these these diagrams come from um, uh, Drexler. Uh, there's a good talk uh, from him here that you can uh, look at. And this is uh, sort of where I, where I, I pulled them. And um, I, I sort of built on these diagrams. And, and from there, uh, uh, I'm looking at other things. Let's see. Um, and I gave a talk uh, about this um, uh, recently. So you can um, care codes here. Uh, you can go go take a look. Um, so, uh, an another way of looking at the same, uh, the same set of things is, is looking at this, uh, resource sharing, um, uh, this way, same exact, uh, kind of diagram. We can bulge it out by looking at it in a log plot. And this is super interesting because it's going to elucidate some, something really important, um, which is kind of what the future looks like when you take into account the orders of magnitude growth. Um, oh, actually, I guess you can't see that because, uh, I'm not sharing the right screen, right? Yeah. Let's see. Here we go. Uh, can you see that? The... Yes. Yeah. Uh, great. So, perfect. Um, so th this is from uh, this structure talk. Um, it's a set of really good diagrams. Um, you can plot the same kind of um, game structure. Then you can uh, bulge it out uh, by taking the log plot, uh, and so this will make clear uh, what happens when you go at orders of magnitude um, uh, into the future. Uh, you can. Think of you know the traditional kind of positive sum uh, set of interactions here the same the same sort of way, uh, but when you look ahead to say um, the great resource expansion and and how much better off everybody is when you um, take into account the um, massive scale improvements uh, in terms of, of value value for all the parties, um, you end up with a, with a very clear um, picture that it just cooperating is dramatically better for for everybody involved, and so this you know in the in the um, Drexler nomenclature, this is what uh, he describes as prior utopia, which is kind of like, um, it's alluding to kind of utopia and, and kind of, you know, kind of a, a place to arrive at. 
Um, I'm with Mark uh, and thinking about kind of the tropism or, or um, orienting people towards this continual um, development towards uh, that outcome. You never quite arrive there. It's just a state of mutual cooperation or um, multi-party cooperation um, is, is the right the right perspective. But, but again, this this uh, diagram kind of gets to the same um, you know similar kind of conclusion that that you really want to avoid risk, um, you want to avoid greed, um, and you want to get to that uh, that cooperative uh, or cooperative structure. So really, the the key question of our time is how do we go from here to here, and how do we create incentive fields um, uh, to bring us there? Um, I have another set of diagrams I will share briefly. Um, so, so I took um, um, I was just playing around with uh, ways of graphing this. It's the same same kind of structure, zero sum game. Uh, we can look at it in a log plot. Uh, we can start looking at different orders of magnitude, um, and and so this is kind of like what the what the games look like at looking at it um, ahead. Uh, this is uh, an attempt at, at graphing Mark's um, diagram from the book. Um, and trying to combine it with uh, the Drexler style kind of orders of magnitude improvement. And so we can see kind of like the 1x game in a log plot here. Um, and we can evaluate, then, then we can sort of hop into the 10x game and, and really recognize that most of the region, uh, regions that potentially seem good in the 1x game are actually not very good. And they're sort of part of the um, Hobbesian trap style um, uh, spot. Uh, when you consider the 10x uh, uh, jump, and this just gets you know exacerbated by looking at um, looking ahead, looking at the potential future, um, and if you sort of keep looking at many different orders of magnitude, you you kind of um, come to the conclusion that there's really just a, a small region um, of this entire space that you really want to be in, which is as close as you can to that um, you know e equal fairness um, line uh, for as many parties as you can possibly um, uh, uh, include. And, and you want to try and create incentive structures that kind of guide all the parties uh, to that, towards that line. Um, because once, once you sort of looking, you know, many orders of magnitude into the future, uh, the past uh, and, and the orders of magnitude lower um, uh, of, of, in terms of resources and value uh, just look dramatically worse than, than that potential future. So without kind of like uh, digging into kind of the, what we're talking about, um, uh, utilitarian style um, maximizing and so on, um, I think we can just kind of look at even just our our lives and how much they've improved relative to the last 100 years 200 years thousand years um the last thing i'll mention uh which is more about um what, what i'm really kind of interested in driving um is that we can use we, we can use these models about prior to uh tropism and prior to Sophia and so on to um kind of uh start start doing some kind of applied Prior to dystopian um, or prior to dystopian goal alignment, by looking around the world and thinking about incentive structures and starting to use uh, mechanism design to start warping the incentive fields to achieve uh, these kinds of outcomes. So, a way of thinking about, thinking about um, uh, economics and game theory and so on is as a way of giving us the tools necessary to survey the landscape, model the systems, and then design technologies that let us get from uh, one local um, optimum to a, some other better local optimum. And here I'd represented with a tunnel boring machine because uh, the, that's what lets you get through uh, through the mountains. Um, a bridge is also a, an excellent uh, uh, way to look at it. Um, really what we kind of want is like to warp the, we, we kind of fail to have good um, examples of this, but what we want is to warp that incentive field down. So really we're kind of tugging at the fabric and we're creating mechanisms that tug at the fabric and, and pull it down so that um, we can all slide together into, uh, into the better optimum. But anyway, this is like a like a good enough um, uh, description. And so the goal is to kind of um, use systems and technologies and so on to look ahead, identify some better optimum, and uh, warp the incentive field so that we can all get there. Then look ahead to the to the next one and keep going together. Um, and of course, along the way, we're going to get a lot more visibility into the landscape. We're going to be able to look at many other potential um, optimal places spots to be. We're going to be able to accelerate these kinds of um, uh, pathways and and so on, and the the um, the tool one of the best tools of our time I think is script economics, and the reason is um, it, it lets us uh, um, combine with kind of like this more long term termist view. It, it, we can reason about the different kind of um, kind of meta um, problems in, in the world and design 
cooperative structures um, that kind of solve some extremely difficult um, uh, coordination problems and can do so in in, in a, um, a, a sort of like a different uh, orders of magnitude of scale uh, and can sort of more fluidly get us to, to solve planetary scale problems. So um, a good example of this is that um, with cryptogonomics, um, and this is part future conversations and so on, uh, but just kind of like a glimpse, a glimpse at it, um, you can break down what would have taken a lot of talking and agreeing and convincing of governments into um, a, a series of experiments of different scale. You can start with small scale experiments um, and increase, it, uh, increase the scale of them and make them voluntary participation experiments that you can just deploy out into the world, enable the parties that want to participate in those experiments to do so, um, test out what works, and then from there scale. Uh, and so I think it's like the, the world's best test bed for uh, cooperative uh, systems design. And, and I think it, this is, uh, um, I think one of the, the most useful sets of um, technologies and tools that people could be working on. So I'll stop here and uh, uh, yield to Mark who, uh, Mark, please correct me if I got anything wrong because uh, you, you uh, these are your concepts. Uh, so, uh, so well, the, um... At this point, there, it's a collaboration of many people, but uh, but yeah, the uh, it started off with the collaboration between uh, Drexler and I, and then, of course, Allison and Christine, um, and I bounced it off a, lo a lot in writing the book. Um, but in any case, uh, I thought that was all very much on track. Uh, I'm really glad that you went through how how this looks under extreme growth because that was one of the things that Drexler. Drexler um, was a very important part of his framework. And it was something that we left out of the book and we probably should add it back in. Um, the one, one thing I want to just mention is that a way to understand the local minima trap is the contrast between a Nash equilibrium and Pareto, Pareto preference. Nash equilibrium is one in which no one can leave without hurting themselves individually. Um, uh, so you're so you're stuck there uh, as uh, as far as self-interested actions goes, but there's some other state of the world that if we could all get there, we would all prefer it. It's just we can't get there incrementally through individual actions. And then this uh, what institution the evolution of institutions historically has often been about is creating arrangements to allow us to jointly make those transitions. And then, as you say, crypto commerce, gives us a whole new technology base for being able to uh, engineer institutions for crossing those, um, uh, you know, crossing those barriers and getting and escaping the Nash equilibrium traps and getting to Pareto preferred worlds. One thing on that, um, that I think is key here um, is that the institutions that we've relied on in most modern nation states um, tend to operate at very large scales. So changes happen usually at the kind of city, state, federal level or international level in, in some cases. And it's extremely difficult to make those jumps between those scales. Um, and today combined with all kinds of um, regulatory capture problems um, lead to uh, just a very di difficult experimental framework. So I think where, um, crypto commerce, crypto economics, and, and so on can be extremely helpful is to give us a much more, uh, a, a, an environment where the jumps are much smaller. Uh, so you can try out things in smaller and smaller scales, test them out. Um, and the jumps between those scales are, are much more fluid uh, because the distance between them is, is um, uh, yeah, are arguably a lot smaller. Um, and so I think it's it's extremely promising as a, as a test bed for uh, a lot of this kind of, uh, this kind of thinking. Though I will say the entire environment is very um, it's in its infancy, I think, still, in that the level of rigorous mechanism design and analysis um, is quite low compared to, I think, what we've done in, in many other in many other fields. Um, when you compare the level of rigor uh, behind, say, designing airplanes and the kind of analysis that goes into designing an airplane and figuring out like all the components and simulations and so on, that is dramatically more sophisticated than what people are doing in the 
um, crypto ecom space. And I think we'll see all of that emerge. And when it does, it'll enable us to um, get solve extremely large problems very quickly. Okay, I have a bunch of questions, but I also have a bunch of hands up. And we'll go with Josia first. Okay, um, cool. So uh, one, I think you had some good points. I want to maybe discuss them, then kind of meander to this, the end of like the last conversation and kind of close back on that. Um, so I, I think that essentially like the analysis of creative tropism is the bulk of a lot of what I imagine this group is about, um, because it talks about specific new agreements that parties in some system can, can make that for whatever reason, were not necessarily available or is easily accessible without cryptocurrency. Um, and that we kind of had these diversions in like earlier in the call and then also in the chat, which may actually also be quite relevant. Diversion is not necessarily the best word, but I felt this like tension that Mark brought up, which is like, Hey, why discuss infinite values? Um, there are some limitations I brought up in terms of like, you know, uh, number one, like humans will evolve. Number two, um, you know, like who knows even how you define value. And, and then, um, you know, we, we kind of discussed here that maybe alien values and so forth. And I feel like there's this massive attention that's coming to this group related to uh, institutions that we could build over the next one to seven years that can provide uh, governance structures for the coming decades, maybe even centuries if we're lucky. Um, and I think that's very different from a time frame that goes several centuries to millennia. Um, and I, I just something to kind of keep in mind. I think the other um, the other point that I would make is that when Kate Sills is kind of discussing uh, this idea of these rights, these unalienable human rights that may not be trade-offable in some some system, I kind of push back and said, well, you know, look, I, I ultimately don't know if you can do that um, because there have to be some trade-offs that are made in real life, right? We pragmatically make these decisions. And I think what I'm driving at with those two points is like, I imagine the system where we're really thinking about here is one where institutions can pop up and leave. Um, they're dynamically generated or destroyed, and they allow us to get to big places that are <coughs> Pareto preferred, um, that, make, that are more Pareto tropic. Um, and we're sort of abandoning this idea that these like st standard institutions will exist for a long enough period of time to protect quote unquote unalienable rights because there are enforcement limitations on those things. <coughs> but we're not necessarily going so we're not necessarily going so far as to define like you know, theoretical optima for um, for values or for these allocations, just sort of redefining a system in which um, better value exchange can occur. And um, that kind of then takes us into the mechanism design comments that, that Juan was working on that I, I spent a lot of time thinking about and a lot of us do as well. But I just thought that that framing would be helpful because I saw some like unspoken tension and the conversation is just really helpful. I just, I thought that might be a helpful way to ground uh, unspoken tension. Yeah, I don't know Juan, if you want to comment immediately, but I also think that, you know, just to bring up another distinction, I think that's really interesting to keep in mind as well is that, you know, we basically say that volunteerism, uh, like, or basically the way, the whole reason of writing this chapter is so that, you know, afterwards we can say, hey, look, you know, values really differ and there's a lot of different conceptions around and volunteerism really enables the independent pursuit of goals. And so, you know, it could be attractive from a variety of different perspectives, but also in establishing to peaceful coexistence. We also want to amplify cooperation for mutual benefit. And so it has both this volunteerism and this cooperation aspect. And, you know, we really say that combining volunteerism at the base with an aspiration for increased cooperation results in this voluntary cooperation and parade of tropian timing. And, you know, to the extent that you think that there's different crypto tools that we can use for doing that, I think, you know, one thing that we also have to focus on is really like the voluntary aspect of that or like the security aspect. So I really wonder if you have a few ideas and you know, already said you have a few projects in mind or something, but, you know, one thing that we want to do with the book is obviously being very concrete and pointing out a, like a few projects that are already on a good path in that regard, but also telling more of the crypto community, hey, look, what you work on is extremely important. Keep going. Uh, and, and, and on the long run, these tools can be really, really world changing. And I think both of this is something that you hit on in the talk as well. They gave it ETH Amsterdam. So I just want to know from you if, and I know we also talked about it a little bit afterwards, but do you have any specific concrete recommendations for systems to build, systems to try, uh, things to experiment with? Because that's ultimately what this book is really for, right? Is to drive action. And I'd love to have your ideas. Yeah, totally. Um, so I'm going to share my screen briefly again. Um, 
Uh, so, so the the set of things, I, th I think there's a lot of different kinds of um, uh, things that are going on that are extremely exciting and promising. Uh, one one plug that I'll make is for just the general orientation towards um, funding and building public goods in the entire ecosystem. And it's not just public goods; it's just in general things that um, have um, that that create this kind of um, much more sustainable growth uh, type of environment. Uh, and so there's there's different uh, things you can go to that can showcase a bunch of the different uh, efforts that people are uh, are making. So um, things like Shelling Point, uh, which is an event that has a set of talks, when in the comments is another another such event. Um, all of the talks here are on YouTube, so you can go uh, find a lot of the uh, tons of like really really great mechanisms. Um, I'll highlight one of the ones that I think are um, perhaps most urgent um from my perspective so i think um i tend to think about uh uh the science and technology uh translation problem a lot i think many of the problems that keep us in this kind of um uh in, in the bad states today or that can lead us to kind of hobson traps or um from the perspective of the future the current hops hobson trap we're in um really come down to uh our rate of knowledge expansion being too slow and our rate of translating that knowledge into viable technologies uh, that can be well diffused and made accessible to, to as many parties as possible, um, also being re uh, really slow. And from my perspective, I think that the big problem is, in, is that while there is a significant incentive field that uh, rewards and incentivizes um, uh, the production of new knowledge, uh, there, there is bad coordination systems going from um, some fundamental conceptual knowledge and into generating all of the, the, the deeper notions of knowledge required to turn those concepts into viable devices and technologies that could be put into products. So the, the world of products um, that are close to a market is well scaled now, and you can walk into, into uh, the broader uh, market and if you have a good idea for a product that is close enough to uh to scalability or close enough to product market fit you can get massive amounts of funding and you can scale it um and the last 20 years i've seen um you know tens of thousands of stories like that or more um of this working extremely well going from very small scales to uh products that you know billions of people use now the 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 problem is that there's a range of of things that are hard to make that um, where the coordination primitives are, are really lacking. So um, things like IP are pretty broken um, and they don't work well to create a, a viable um, incentive, incentive structure for people to generate ideas here uh, or to generate prototypes or to generate uh, things that push along um, uh, some, some insights. And it's worth noting that, you know, one of the places that, that did this extremely well during the, uh, the 20th century in, in the labs, there was an enormous amount of effort uh, dedicated to the the process of translating conceptual, very basic fundamental conceptual knowledge into practical, useful um, uh, devices that could then later be put into products. And that was a, a systematic um, thing that Bell has learned a lot about how to do well. Um, and part of the reason for their success was that they um, approached that problem with with a vast resources relative to to many other organizations at that time, um, and with a, with a very strong systematic approach on how to do this coordinated work uh, to push things along and get them to the point where they could be they could be products. And from my perspective, we, we're lacking that kind of an incentive structure in the world now. And and what we're missing is um, systems and structures that can um, make profitable um, doing this kind of work, independent of whether the the thinking is say good enough to be academically relevant or rewardable or independent of whether or not those things are quite ready to be um, uh, put into a product. I think today um, the the kind of like um, maybe dominant strategies here are either um, the, the a few companies that get started out of academic labs, um, starting new companies from scratch in it, when, when it feels uh, totally long-term rational but short-term irrational. Um, so things like Tesla and SpaceX are a good example of this. Um, and what, what the crypto world is now exploring is ways of creating mechanisms here 
uh, to incentivize this. So I think that there's some good highlights on ways of doing IP with NFTs and changing the marketplace dynamics. Um, impact certificates, I think, are, are tremendously promising. An impact certificate is a, is a mechanism by which you can um, maybe create a, a market for, for impact um, and, and sort of bottle up impact and, and, and sell it and transfer it the same way that you can sort of bottle up utility with, with currency. Um, and I think there's a, there's a set of mechanisms that are, that are really critical. Uh, they're getting explored. That's kind of what the, uh, this funding the commons event is dedicated to It's is exploring those kinds of mechanisms. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think Evan is running that like really wonderfully. And I think you have another one coming up in June or something in, uh, in, uh, in, in New York, I think I heard already, but, um, okay. That's already a uh, lot and like pretty actionable, um, without wanting to take it too far away. Um, there's one thing that I think you also care a lot about, which is uh, epistemic agents and actually agents that can perhaps allow, uh, yeah, can aid human decision-making and just, you know, as we have you here, this is also something that I think there's some alignment, at least within this group and, and some of your thinking, um, in the sense that we also care about how can we strap in artificial intelligences or uh, as intelligences just get more gradually more more intelligent, how can we uh, combine them into this uh, cooperative uh, dynamic in a decentralized way? Can you perhaps just code your thinking on that uh, in a few layers? A, how can they help us become a little bit more uh, sophisticated? And then also, how can we cooperate with them moving forward? Uh, 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 hard question. So I think I have a lot of different thoughts on this. Um, I haven't thought very concretely about the near-term AI systems helping us a lot. Like there's some maybe straightforward things where some of the AI systems that we have now could be deployed to um, figure out whether things are true or not um, and to assist in the in the scientific process where um, you can do everything from um, even hypothesis generation now um, to reasoning about all, all kinds of potential systems and so on. And it, that can be very helpful. Um, or you can um, apply these in, in a lot of user interfaces and so on to help people help humans navigate this massive um, deluge of information that we're struggling to parse through and just give us a higher leverage way of, uh, of interacting than, you know, kind of trying to parse through strings. Um, uh, I tend to think about a lot of this from, from a mimetic, um, standpoint, not uh, mimetic, not mimetic. So, um, this is about kind of strands of information and how they copy what's likely to make them successful. Um, why would they replicate? Why would other people, um, uh, choose to rep to, to hold a meme, um, and, and pass it on and so on and trying to get to the kind of largest, most correct mimetic set or like, <laughs> uh, not yet proven wrong mimetic set that, that we might have. So in a preparing style, um, trying to get to, um, uh, the best mimetic set that we can, um, and hold a lot of different candidate mimetic sets. Um, and, and how do you get as many people as possible around the world to, um, understand those mimetic sets, you have knowledge cover over that set. So one, one way that I tend to think about it is like, if you, if you were to, uh, first assemble the graph of knowledge of, of what do we actually know as a species, what have we, um, tested, um, connect that to both explanations that could be help people, um, learn the concepts faster and to the, to the evidence that we have for those pieces of knowledge. So for example, um, connected to the set of experiments, set of papers. Uh, and so on, ideally reproducible science, um, and then would be doing a lot better off. Um, and then from there, you could then start thinking of reasoning about, well, okay, great. Like what is the current knowledge cover for, um, for humanity as a whole? Like you could sort of like have, you know, create a matrix of like, here's all the concepts we have and here's all the humans, uh, what is the current knowledge cover? And uh, my guess is that if you could, uh, just increase that by, by, you know, some significant percentage, um, tons of problems would get solved dramatically faster. Uh, but I, I don't know if that's quite what uh, you're. Yeah, wonderful. I think it's quite nice with one thing that I think Mark and Eric were also discussing in one of the early Xanadu papers is that they take inspiration from Karl Popper, who observed that knowledge much as biology evolves by a process of variation, replication, and selection, variation of knowledge as in tossing new ideas out there, replication of knowledge as in spreading ideas through conversation, and selection of knowledge as the discrediting of ideas to criticism. And I thought that's like a very I think, interesting way in which like you can already build lots of systems for that. And, and I think people are, are, are really trying. Um, okay, wonderful. 
Uh, okay, we have a few questions here and probably like a lot more after we like uh, open up a, a bunch of more Pandora's boxes. First one, you have Alan Cobb. Um, yeah, I, many years ago, I wrote an, an automated negotiation tool that used a tree search, like if you were playing chess. And, uh, you know, it was just a simple negotiation, buying a pair of shoes. And um, the tool made an ultimatum. It turned out after a week of debugging, trying to find the bug, I realized it had discovered the Nash equilibrium. Um, so I made a change and I added to the lack of knowledge of the other party's utility function, lack of knowledge of the other party's constraints. In other words, where their utility function went to negative infinity. So we're getting to infinities again. Um, and what that did, it led to strategies of negotiation that had exactly the effect shown in Marx's figures, where you moved to the upper right along the diagonal without any voluntarism, except the ability to stop when the other person violated your constraints. And I just thought that was an interesting observation here that you didn't need explicit cooperation to get the desired effect. Uh, and I couldn't get it published because I'm not capable, I'm not competent to do the required proofs. I do have a tech report. Yeah, Alan, if you could uh, uh, send the link to the tech report. I think we even That's included that in a longer version of the book. And since we had to cut everything, it's still there in a longer version of it. We also have uh, Lucius. Sorry, getting to the unmute button. <laughs> So I, I actually very much agree with uh, with Juan's uh, secondary thesis that uh, the uh, the toolkit of the uh, crypto technologies is very very important uh, for uh, crossing the boundary. One of the ways I like to think about um, the the boundary, sort of crossing the gap that we're discussing here, is as a, a proxy for for how difficult it is is the complexity of cake cutting, right? So fair cake cutting has ridiculous complexity. <laughs> the, be the best known algorithm is just like, the description of the complexity is just up through the roof. Um, and and so, so finding the pathways that are gonna get us from here to there is incredibly difficult. And that's why we need uh, very, very good uh, toolkits to help accelerate our, and um, amplify our ability to search. Uh, um, our hypothesis at Archain is very much that if we deliver the technologies at scale, then the self-organization becomes tremendously amplified. Uh, but I do uh, um, wish to, to you know, uh, remind people that um, so far, the, 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 the best solutions for scaling have been terrible. Uh, and that has been a tremendous um, a blockade for widespread adoption, especially with large scale institutions. Um, and part of that, again, and this reflects on what I was saying about finding the uh, uh, f finding our way uh, across from here to there, is that there are conceptual blind spots. So con compositionality is very much a conceptual blind spot for human beings. Uh, and this is easily seen because, you know, our very best physicists um, who have proposed the most accurate scientific theories ever, both of the theories failed to be compositional. So both general relativity and quantum mechanics failed in their original presentations to be compositional. And that is in fact why they don't fit together. Um, so, so there are blind spots and, and learning how to overcome those blind spots is, is also an important part of the puzzle. Uh, so I'll uh, hand over the, hand the mic back. Thank you. Any comments, Mark, Juan, Andrews? Okay, so uh, yeah, Mark. I, did. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to, want to say that the, the kind of agent-based simulation that Jason started off with, you know, that we started off seeing from Jason uh, is very important part of this toolkit in trying to construct these institutions. Uh, Jason, tell me if you agree with this, but for any particular result from an agent-based simulation, including the one that you saw, an audience should always take the particular results with you know, huge grains of salt. 
uh, because you know one can construct different simulations that come to very different conclusions. But the agent-based simulation is very valuable for making clear what the implications are of a given set of premises, and they're often very counterintuitive when played out, and that the answer to an agent-based simulation whose result you're skeptical of is another agent-based simulation that may surprise you in a different way. Uh, and that none of these things are necessarily predictive of how an actual system with, with, with real human beings um, uh, would interact with each other, uh, but they're a lot better in many cases than just trying to examine it in your head or just trying to work out closed form equations. Jason, already had to leave. And Anders, did you want to say something? Yeah, basically Mark said what I was going to say, uh, but better. Actually, I spent a fair bit of today doing an agent-based simulation of battles in Dungeons and Dragons, because, and comparing them to my analytic uh, formulation. And it's very interesting to, again, learn where the analytic formulation breaks down. And I think having a good way of making agent-based models uh, available to explain, this is what follows from various assumptions and making it cheap and easy to also try out a wide range of assumptions and complications is very valuable. The final point is that many of these agent-based simulations are using stupid agents. And that is actually a virtue because if it turns out that this is stable, even when agents are pretty stupid, that is a good reason to believe that this can actually be made to work. You might want to check that really clever agents can't outwit the simulation and mess things up. But quite often, it's the opposite that is true. If some agents are too stupid to understand the equilibrium and that makes the equilibrium break down, that's worth noticing. Wonderful. Michael. Hey, everyone. Good convo. Um, I totally agree that you know the intermediary steps are poorly incentivized. So I'm with you on that. And then let's assume we can incentivize people you know, with a, a token economic system, crypto economic system to tackle the, the messy middle. How do you think about the like sort of, let's say post bounty um, economics, like the sort of the, the secondary trading market um, after let's say the molecule, you know, that the drug is created. Is it just the same as the current world or is it different? So I'm guessing that's uh, specific uh, to me kind of showing the, the science and, and uh, technology uh, diagrams and so on. Um, I think there's a lot of different mechanisms that are required and they vary by field. Uh, so for example, um, one thing we can do is study the IP system and understand what's broken about it and generate better instruments. So um, if you look at the IP transactions, they're extremely expensive to engage in and they tend not to um, fare well for um, Anybody who who tries to use them as a as a mode of actually generating revenue, they tend to be primarily used by large corporations to block each other or to force partnerships and so on. And like that's the today the one of the primary uses of IP. Um, and so, but however, that doesn't need to be the case. You could generate a different set of instruments that um, behave differently um, by, for example, having a marketplace that enforces certain rules. Uh, so think of it kind of like how. Um, uh, Airbnb or or Uber and Lyft and so on um, changed the dynamics of of other marketplaces that that either already existed in smaller scales um, or didn't exist in certain regions at all. So, for example, if you had uh, you know one one kind of um, straw example uh, of something like this, imagine that you had a marketplace for IP where um, all IP that is listed has a specific price and it follows a particular function, a decreasing value function. Um, all the way down to zero when the IP um, expires. And at any point, any party can walk uh, to this marketplace and buy that IP and buy a, a right to use it. They do not have to interact with you. They do not have to send an email. They do not, you don't get the ability to block them because you don't like them or because you um, are worried about their use or something like that. that. That kind of marketplace for IP might both generate significantly more revenue for, uh, for the parties generating that IP and might, um, lead to IP actually being used in beneficial ways as opposed to mostly negative ways in, in some in some environments, uh, especially in, com in computer science, where most 
IP sort of is a way of like holding back the future. Um, uh, it's mostly in biotech where IP really protects um, uh, small companies from uh, pharma distributing molecules and so on. Uh, so I think like it, it structures like that, that change, that, that evaluate some transaction and figure out what the market failure is and try to change the dynamics of the transaction um, and the broader market can be extremely, extremely useful. And that's one example. Other examples include um, things like, um, you, you, one thing I think is very promising is um, the ability to create like a, a, a new kind of unit for a lab where um, you could get funding for a lab doing R&D, get the rights to the IP of the, of the uh, stuff that you produce, and then um, uh, either and then invest in the companies that go use that IP. So instead of just directly selling IP, you become um, an in investment oriented entity um, that gets to um, get part of the, the whole appreciation of uh, of the capital that might go into into specific companies and so on. Uh, so you can think of like these um, entities being being uh, potentially really successful in some specific environments. I, I think we, things like flagship are an example of doing this in a, a, at a different scale, right? So, or, or, or uh, there are some other um, type of entities like this that are, that are exist in the, in the, in the kind of larger world, but setting those up is extremely expensive. And I think you can use um, crypto structures to drop the cost of starting those things. Um, like today you can walk up to a crypto network and, and create a DAO and have a tr shared treasury and have shared voting along that treasury in minutes. Um, whereas in, you know, kind of like, it's a fairly difficult thing to to implement in in the traditional legal structures, um, especially if you don't know what you're doing in the in the in the navigating the legal landscape and and you know how you have to like learn an enormous amount of of details before you can um, uh, reason well about uh, how to start corporations and what liabilities you're you're walking into and so on. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Very, yeah. very interesting. I it's think really, one thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> can I respond real quick? So I think, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, the idea that in a crypto economic world, yeah, you can customize the market to the participants and the use case essentially. Whereas in a more analog inspired world, i.e., you know, fiat currency, it's arguably kind of fat thumbing our interactions. It's a cool idea. Thanks, Juan. Yeah, I think one thing that was interesting at ETH Amsterdam we had um, a kind of sidetrack as well on DSI, Decentralized Science. And we had a few of the organizations that were here mentioned in the chat, like LabDAO, uh, VitaDAO, Molecule, and so forth, that are doing IPMTs. Um, I think that one thing that you mentioned, Juan, of impact certificates, um, there's now already like somewhat of a marketplace. We're currently thinking, for example, Foresight is doing the, building these technology trees of mapping out entire areas and figuring out what bottlenecks in these areas are. And one could imagine just people being able to very decentralized fund individual nodes of these, and then afterwards being able to use the fact that they funded them as an uh, um, as a like basically as a proof that they were in early in funding that specific bit and using that even as an input certificate that they could then trade on, and then in hindsight you can figure out maybe who has done the right bits on specific parts of technologies very early on. And so I think the entire sector of DSI is uh, I think a really I think flourishing rate, which. Um, Many projects are currently doing, I think, of uh, a lot of what you mentioned. Um, I want to, um, as we, I think, you know, uh, get uh, really into, deep into the hour, also mention the other bit that you mentioned, like the flip side of that, basically, which you also brought up in the talk. And that's the um, question of existential risk. And I know that, you know, we won't really have the time to get into the entire thing. But if you look, for example, at the outline of the book, so we had these forward and what's at stake, like these were the discussion of the last two meetings. Today we're discussing meet the players and value diversity, but then uh, next time we and we're discussing skim the manual. I'm really diving into the mechanism a bit more, but then the next two weeks after that is really about okay, how can we actually improve cooperation using all of these crypto tools? What does it mean to reinvent information, money, rights, contracts, privacy? Afterwards, we're discussing how to move into that world, but then we're really tackling the other part, and that's more the volunteerism part of like, what does it mean to also defend against the threat, right? And both physical threats, but also cyber threats before we incorporate artificial intelligences. But so if we wanted to double click a little bit on these two bits, you know, one thing is just improving the cooperative structures that we already have. We can improve them all along. And I think we should definitely do that. But I think given the existential risk and, uh, and, and, and the way that they're being cropped up, 
you know, I think one really great thing would be just to not die on the path to that because we're already on a pretty good trajectory, or at least so we say so in the book. And so do you have any hunches of specific technologies that can also help us there, like specific cryptographic tools, whatnot? Maybe you have a hunch, maybe m- maybe you don't, but just like you just mentioned uh, IP NFTs, maybe you have a few bits as well that can help us just not to fall into hops and traps or let them spiral out of control uh, and so forth. We are going to have a workshop on that later, but perhaps you have a few ideas as well. Um, uh, and is that, Alex, is that to me? Or? Yeah, yeah. It's just a question because sure. you had great ideas, like very specific ideas on the positive bits. How can we cooperate better? Yeah, thank you. Also have so, ideas on like, what is the, how can we got to get through? Yeah, so a, a way to sort of summarize my, uh, my thinking on this is that I think we're in an extremely critical century. Um, we have seen tremendous global improvement along almost every scale um, that we can measure in terms of human well-being and so on. Um, and though there are some like massive scale problems that we have to solve, but, um, we're um, making progress or solving them not nearly as fast as we should. But um, you know, overall, the, the general story over the last few centuries has been of tremendous improvement. Um, I would argue last few millennia, um, potentially longer. Uh, we have this really difficult phase transition ahead of us where we are, um, we discovered um, computing and we discovered our ability to uh, create computers um, out of uh, systems that can evolve quickly. So very different to genetic computing or memetic computing, we now have the ability to do this digital computing thing that is extremely, um, it's evolving extremely quickly. And we will be generating a set of technologies over the next few decades that um, you can totally change the the, the outcome of, of where everything is headed. Um, and we now have gotten enough understanding and insight in into reality and so on to recognize that there are some significant X risks, um, in particular those that um, we, tend to generate, um, the natural ones are kind of very far away and, and from our perspective, like they're very unlikely to, um, to be serious threats, uh, given the, <laughs> given that this light here, um, and our ability to get out of the gravity well, um, kind of, um, obviates a lot of the other, um, X risks. Uh, however, um, I think things like, uh, getting into some major scale war or, um, messing up some of these uh, technological transitions uh, could be could be extremely extremely difficult. Now, I think the, the largest meta problem is that we have inadequate macro systems. So, our um, systems have been extremely useful so far in generating the growth and improvement that we've seen over the last few centuries. Um, but they're struggling now with the kind of problems that we have um, uh, at this moment. So, things like preventing um, large scale war um, and preventing uh, a nuclear war and um, preventing the buildup of bio. Um, build. Arguably, they've done a pretty good job at preventing the buildup of bio warfare in the last few decades, uh, but the problem is going to get way harder over the next few decades. Um, and right now, we're not very well set up for it yet. Um, and so I think the the thing the, the things that I think are going to be extremely optimistic um, uh, to kind of deal with this problem is that, um, oh, and sorry, what else to mention, um, our current macro systems are very inadequate when it comes to the computing phase transition. Um, it's just, there's very difficult ways of, it, it, it's not entirely clear how you, they, they could even possibly have good answers to, to contribute here because, um, what, what is likely to happen is that the level of power conferred by some of the technologies that are going to be created um, will be will be so attractive to the different parties that the different parties will have to race, and that is a surefire way of um, building things on safely. Um, so I think like the the biggest kind of highest priority on this is to explore as fast as we can much better alternate governance structures and governance systems for larger and larger scale problems. So start with smaller problems and govern those. Figure out how to govern the commons of a um, of a digital, uh, system like, um, like a social media network or, or t- start with something even smaller, figure out how to govern those things well as, as systems, um, learn from that, um, and scale the governance structures to then be able to tackle, um, things like 
managing the um, the broader um, set of resources that we have uh, across the planet and how to avoid and prevent some of the large scale potential problems that, that we may have. Um, I think we're, we're kind of like due for some kind of very, very light um, planetary style uh, government structure that is actually able to prevent war or something like that and, and enforce some like very, very, very basic um, uh, 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 security principles. Um, and I think that those kinds of things can emerge from better um, coordination structures and better coordination systems. So I think the the exploration, and this is why I think um, the crypto econ stuff is so so potentially promising. And I, I didn't really think of, think this until the last, say, five years. I've been in crypto longer, but um, I think I got very optimistic about the potential outlook by seeing the scale at which these crypto networks grew and the kinds of governance challenges that they're running into and the very smooth and easy um, path to come up with a new uh, structure and deploy it into the world extremely quickly. So um, it's the the scale of experimenta experimentation that you get in a traditional software world, um, but applied to governance structures and economics. So it's doing economics and doing governance um, imagining, but you have a complete CI, you know, con continuous integration and continuous deployment system where you can get to deploy some entirely new structure out into the world and, and watch it work uh, or not work um, and, and so on. It's incredibly powerful. Um, and so I think we the the thing that we need to do is kind of explore this landscape of governance systems um, uh, efficiently so that we can, quickly and efficiently, so that we can spot really, really good things that can work at larger and larger scales, learn from those, so then kind of um, upgrade our macro systems. Because our macro systems are, are, are um, Kind of breaking at the seams right now with some some system some problems that are kind of smaller than the 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 scale of problems that's ahead. Uh, I'm very optimistic about about the potential though. I think like the the growth rates here show that um we can likely do it. Wonderful, uh, interesting. Well, I think one thing that um you know I think is really difficult to guard against, and we we'll get to that in later chapters, but it's really this. Kind of like navigating two traps on the one hand you have the first trap which is really the trap of the risk that you already showed which is really the dangerous dynamic of nuclear weapons and so forth increasing right but then on the other hand like our current structures of dealing with those um also come with their own risks attached and that's really this kind of trap two civilization suicide by a single point of failure because i think the only tools that we currently have are really building up to these more you know, top-down, uh, more legacy type of structures that come with their own risks. And I think they are, these risks are often somewhat undervalued. And I think really figuring out how crypto systems can help us build um, kind of like structures that are safe against both of these risks is something that we have to really incredibly come to terms with. I think especially surveillance will be a really, really big one. And then automat automatic and robotic enforcement, those are things that are kind of like just the, the economics of it, or at least so we argue, uh, are already kind of happening. And it's more about designing these systems that uh, can, can be relatively uh, safe uh, versus not. And I wonder, yeah, if you have uh, already like a specific hunch for, for what these systems could be, I think they're pretty difficult to design for. Yeah, I think, I think they are extremely difficult to design for. Um, I think that, I think, I think that large scale, large governments are now encountering both the power that these digital systems give them and the risks. And so we there will be both many groups that are open to better solutions and who will both fund and install. Usually the install part is the hard part, um, better systems. Uh, however, you also have to guard against some groups who will rightly recognize how powerful these systems are and potentially lock in place a um, digitally a digital totalitarian structure that is extremely difficult to get out of. So um, I think it's something where um, we agree very, it's in the book and, and we agree very strongly that um, there, there is a possibility here of a digital, uh, digital totalitarianism um, that is extremely difficult to get out of um, uh, or potentially impossible. And, and that would be um, really, really bad outcome. Um, and so I think the, maybe what matters in the, in the short to medium term is to, um, 
identify the sets of um, reasons why government systems require these surveillance systems and these other security computing oriented security systems um, and provide really good solutions that protect rights. So that means build structures that are compatible with um, right systems and with um, that kind of follow the, the principles of the, of the legal systems that we have and, and so on um, and limit the, the um, ability of government systems to abuse those systems. Um, and then rush to kind of install like broadly, um, again, broadly test them, get to a good state and then, and then install them, um, before some very kind of large scale nefarious system, uh, develops. Um, I do think that there is, um, we, we live in a really good time when a lot of people in across many macro systems worldwide really want to do better and want to just improve society for their people. Um, and they're just lacking tools and they tend to have to choose between a lot of limited sets of tools. And so if we can build better structures that are in line with the, the broader long-term goals and, and provide those as really good systems that they can deploy, um, I think we can get it to get to, into a really good alignment. Um, I think the problem happens when um, people aren't working in those systems, people aren't looking ahead um, and then some kind of like halfway solution that is um th that just kind of gives uh massive amounts of, of power to um uh government systems as, as a proxy for hey let's figure it out later and it's like let's get all the power now and then figure out like a good thing to do later um i think those kinds of structures are tremendously dangerous and and what i think um kind of setting aside the question of like what party today or, or whatever may have access to these systems, even assuming that all the groups around the world are very well intentioned and trying to um, vie for the best interests by building extremely powerful surveillance systems and not only surveillance, but later on um, enforcement systems. Enforcement is just right around the corner. You can think of like automated enforcement, like what uh, what is going on in China today with the social credit system, where you can get automatic enforcement of behavior um, by just hooking into like the train system, let alone let, or, or automatic fines, uh, delivered to you by mail, right? Like by catching you, um, doing something, uh, and then getting automatic fines or, um, getting knocked out of, um, social networks and so on. So those kinds of systems, um, both the surveillance and enforcement piece are viable today, uh, and it's, they're going to get more and more powerful. Um, and I think what's really important is that we out compete those systems in the same set of goals that kind of um, the broad-based, um, uh, more freedom-oriented uh, governments um, uh, are trying to achieve, right? So you want those groups to be way more successful and to achieve kind of like the the, um, the security goals and the, the rights protection goals and so on with much more um, aligned systems than, than, um, than just leaning into the... Um, the, the, the short-term danger, uh, because the problem is like once these very powerful surveillance and, and, um, enforcement systems get deployed, um, it's just a matter of time until some party gains control of government and then can use them for, um, pretty terrible use cases. Um, and so you want those systems to, by default, be, um, not ab abusable in those kinds of structures. And, and I think there's a lot of different kinds of potential strategies to do that. Um, and this is where, um, all of the work around, um, um, secure soft software and verifiable computation and, um, large scale multi-party computation, um, distributed systems and so on, uh, helps a lot because there's a lot of really, really good cryptographic tools that can enforce certain structures and yield a broadly installed system that is extremely difficult to um, to abuse and take over and, you know, blockchains are a really good example of, um, you know, an isolated case of, of, of this kind of thing, or just a broad, um, cryptography, um, that we have uh, protecting our communications is another good example of, of this kind of. Wonderful. I, I would love to hear from Anders who already proposed a few systems. And I know that this term, um, 
uh, safe surveillance or structured transparency. Those are terms that also Ben Garfinkel, who's a Fawcett Fellow and who's at FHI, wrote a fantastic paper on. So Anders, maybe you can give us a few solutions uh, in that regard, because it so sounds like you've been writing a paper on this too. Well, yeah. So the paper I was pu uh, pushing in the comments is a more general paper, uh, which is more relevant for thinking about the big X and central risk. Basically, it's a portfolio strategy. How, how do I allocate my limited resources in fighting existential risks? Where in the risk chain is it rational to put in the effort? And uh, we basically solve the, the basic simple problem. But then we point out what I think is the much more interesting problem, which is tied to Joan's uh, point here. The systems for fixing the risks and defending us against um, uh, the problems need to be maintained themselves. There is a lot of uh, important uh, kind of soft systems uh, and mechanisms that matter for us being able to resist the actual risks. And one interesting thing that came up when you mentioned human rights, at one part of my mind would say, yay, I'm very much in favor of rights. And then the other part of my mind says, oh, nonsense of stilts. I've been hanging around British philosophers long enough to know that actually quite a lot of rights talk is very problematic. But then there is a rather nice solution to it and say, actually, rights are in many ways a heuristic. It's very much a Giger answer style heuristic where we simplify uh, a lot of complex uh, other evaluations and turn them into relatively short, simple, fixed rules that are easy to agree, that are transparent enough that we can implement them legally or even in code even though we might then have some profound disagreement about whether we're fundamental laws of the universe or just some human relative convention. And this is again where we get to this interesting and messy domain where we might not have the beautiful mathematical generalizations or philosophical generalization, but a lot of the hard work of writing proper code, writing proper law, and also explaining the code and law to the users so they actually understand what's going on. Because I think that is the last part that is needed. Bruce Schneier uh, and uh, his co-author wrote this brilliant paper on common um, knowledge attacks against democracy, where it, they pointed out that common knowledge is basically what makes open societies work. If we know roughly how things are regulated and work and who's in charge, even if we don't agree with them, we can make uh, agreements work. And this is where authoritarian forces generally try to sabotage things. Of course, we can sabotage things for about authoritarians by giving uh, the citizens of uh, authoritarian countries ways of communicating and establishing common knowledge, which is very destructive for the authoritarians. So it goes both ways. But it shows that these mechanism designs are very important. And I have a feeling that we need to have a good package of mechanism design that we need to teach people in school or later on and can then be deployed for making future systems like this to work. Because I think the hardest part here is explaining to most people who don't have much time and much interest why they can trust something, why this makes sense. This is a bit like the cake splitting. Uh, if it's splitting a cake between two, it's obvious why one divides and the other chooses works. The three person cake splitting problem already takes too long to, for people to figure out. So we need to come up with a better way of doing that. Thank you. Uh, I do want to say we have a workshop on that later this year in October 3 and 4, um, which will be discussing more of these tools and how we can actually implement them. I also wanted to give it uh, in the last few minutes, maybe to Lucius and Rick for brief comments before we discuss next week. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I did want to uh, amplify and echo uh, Juan's comments about the, the very serious risks. I mean, right now we're looking at uh, both the U.S. government uh, and and many other governments in the midst of implementing CDBCs, and uh, the public has no idea how dangerous this can be. It is now standard practice for law enforcement to freeze accounts if someone is suspected of wrongdoing. With a CB CDBC, uh, you could just say the wrong thing, and suddenly you find yourself locked out of all resources that you thought you had with the press of a button. And currently, uh, the only uh, community that has provided any balance or, or uh, um, informed debate on this topic is the crypto community. Uh, so I think it is, it is what, what Juan is, is pointing out is absolutely essential. Uh, and, and it is very, very important 
to recognize that if the crypto community is going to be effective, it has to learn how to interface with the existing structures. It can't just outcompete because these uh, the existing uh, infrastructures get to get to fight in an unfair way, right? So the yeah, SEC yeah. has no problem do, just shut people down. Yeah, we do talk about the idea of a genetic takeover uh, in a later part of the book. I think it's chapter six. Uh, so we'll definitely get to that part of like a gradual co-evolution and um, that will lead to better systems. Rick. Yeah, I'm Rick Schwal, and I simply haven't figured out how to change my name in the Zoom. Anyway, um, there's an old idea that's thrown around called the Iron Law of Oligarchs, which basically is people who have excess resources, which we'll call wealth, will use it to acquire more power, which they will use to acquire more power, which they will use to acquire more power. Uh, has anybody got an argument that uh, a crypto based system would be immune to that. And if you think you've got an answer, I point you to the website. Web three is going great. I'll put it here in the chat, which documents a whole bunch of cases where these quote decentralized blockchain systems have been, you know, Pull, done of what's called a rug bull or otherwise centrally stolen a lot of people's money or a hacker became the central guy who stole a lot of people's money. Over. I can, I can well, maybe comment on that a bit. Um, there's this, we had a really good discussion on this last week. Um, this idea that like, we want to support decentralization for its own sake, but it's actually quite difficult to um, support decentralization efforts when a small number of people understand a lot of how cryptocurrencies work. And also, as you mentioned, a lot of people who get power then try to get more power and so on. And um, I think that there is some sense of basic fairness, which is why we have ideas like universal basic income and so on, where people who do accumulate a lot of power don't want to monopolize it so much that they uh, kind of destroy everyone else's access to any basic sense of decency. But um, I'm not sure that that's something we can exclusively rely on for dignity reasons and also pragmat pragmatic reasons. Um, and so I, I tend to kind of see crypto as something where the goal is to help people become better dictators of their own lives, so to speak. Um, so you, you the idea is like you're self-sovereign, meaning you can actually go and be as power grabby as you want, um, but you're just doing it in a system that is helping you to like coordinate with others. And as we discuss in a lot of our uh, you know, research in this group, it's actually better to do voluntary cooperation such that you help other people by helping yourself. So it's important for mechanism designers to like help uh, people who are accumulating power, distribute power to other people in the process of making themselves better off not, I think, treating power as a zero-sum game where the best and brightest have to give up power, quote-unquote, because they're going to try to gain the system so that it doesn't necessarily happen. Thank you so much, Jazeera. That's a really wonderful, uh, I think, and a great way in which you could you brought in last week's discussion. Um, I think one thing in which we could really end on is, A, there is now a bounty for this week, and this bounty is all about um, what do values mean now and uh, on the very long run? Uh, will verge values converge? Will they drift? Uh, what will happen with them? So that's um, definitely the Morpheus Africa and angle with which we started the book. And then I would love for you guys to also uh, please take a look at next week's chapter in which we really get uh, Alice, your audio cut out, right? Um, as soon as you said next week's yeah. chapter. I don't know if you can hear us. Oh, you're, it looks like you're muted now, too. Yep. Sorry, Mark, say again. Uh, you, your audio, I'm glad you're back. Your audio cut out uh, right after you mentioned next week's chapter. Uh, also, by the way, as long as I have the mic, I'll just mention next week is on Saturday rather than Sunday. 
yes, next week is on Saturday at 11 a.m. And next week we'll discuss more the actual structures or like the mechanisms behind voluntary cooperation, how they developed in the past and how they evolved in the past and how it is exactly that we can now rebuild and improve on them with crypto systems. And so that will be the readings for next week. Okay, everyone, thank you so much, Juan. I can't thank you enough for joining on such short notice. Really, really wonderful. I recommend all of you check out his talk at ETH Amsterdam. Thank you so, so much for staying on for such a long time. And I can't wait to see all of you next week uh, at around the same time, but this time on chapter is chapter nine. on uh, Skim the Manual. And so we're going to send out an Thank you so, so much for joining. Also, Anders and David, it was really, really, really wonderful to have you as part of this. I really thoroughly enjoyed today's discussion. Thanks for staying on for so long.